Welcome to the Mom Entrepreneur Success Podcast with Mariana C. Ruiz, the podcast for the go-getter mom entrepreneur who refuses to let motherhood slow her down from achieving success and making an impact. Tune in Mondays to learn the success secrets of top influencers who also happen to be moms so that you can reach the success, freedom, and impact you desire. Ready to create success on your terms, mom entrepreneur? Head on over to marianacruiz.com slash success to download your copy of The Game Plan. It's a step-by-step process to get you results and enjoy every step of the journey. Because as mom entrepreneurs, it's about designing a business around our lives and not the other way around. Plus, I also walk you through areas where you might get stuck to help you avoid the pitfalls that so many of us have to go through. So head on over to marianacruiz.com to get your copy now. Welcome back to the Mom Entrepreneur Success Podcast. Today, I have Dana Malstaff on the show. Dana is a mother, an author, a business and content strategist, coach, podcaster, and a blind spot reducer. Dana is the author of Boss Mom, The Ultimate Guide to Raising a Business and Nurturing Your Family Like a Pro, and the founder of the Boss Mom Movement. She serves boss moms who yearn for more time, less guilt when it comes to building their business and raising their family by providing the tools that they need to get more out of their content and their business without sacrificing their family goals. When she's not creating new courses and building new strategy tools for creative entrepreneurs, she can be found chasing her son on the beach, watching her daughter take the first steps, or thinking of the next fun new family adventure. Welcome, and I'm so excited to have you, Dana. Thank you for having me. Thanks. So I'm really excited to dig into this. I think one of the things that I love about your message is helping moms with the mom guilt. So can you tell us like a little bit about how you got started in this online business venture? I know a little bit about your story and how you had some other businesses before, but like, can you tell us what came first? Was it obviously some business, but tell us a little bit about how you got started. Yeah, sure. So I think there are probably a lot of women out there that you know, got pregnant, they took the maternity leave, decided they didn't want to go back to work or wanted to discover something new. I did the opposite. I left my job to start my business and then immediately got pregnant. I think my body said, oh, you're not going to work 14 hour days. Awesome. Let's have a baby. So, (laughs) So I immediately got pregnant and in the whole time was trying to figure out how to be a mom, how to be an entrepreneur, how to be good at both, how to just figure out both, which are both really hard things. And in the midst of that, I was starting a business that was more in the line of mindful communication coaching, which is kind of my passion is communication. And so along the lines of, you know, trying to get, figure that out, trying to figure out the online world, moved to California from, we were in Columbus, Ohio at the time to be closer to my family and discovered kind of a new world here of entrepreneurs, which San Diego is an amazing, amazing place for entrepreneurs. So was still figuring out my business, was getting some success, but it was an uphill battle. And then I got pregnant with my daughter. And so my son was one when I got, so I basically just, you know, let's have the babies one right after each other, kind of, kind of plan. I got pregnant with my daughter and that's when I, you know, was basically in the midst of being pregnant when I realized what I wanted to do. Business strategy is really where my space was and not because I had, you know, done something in my first business that was always one of my gifts. And I was just kind of ignoring it to do something I thought I was passionate about instead of doing something that I was actually really good at and had been good at in corporate America. And so I decided to jump into that and found a lot of its success, but it's also hard to differentiate yourself. So I was in a mastermind group. I had been invited in and one of the people that was in it was a book coach and said, Hey, I'm going to give you guys a great deal. If you want to write a book, then let's do it now. Cause he was actually moving to China to switch jobs. And I said, yes, do it. I've always wanted to write a book. It was on my bucket list. And so we sat down and I discovered that what I really wanted to write about was this idea of feeling guilty that I wanted to be an entrepreneur, that I wanted my kids to go to daycare for at least part of the time because I wanted to work on my business. And it was just as much my baby as my babies were. And that made me feel massively guilty. And I'd finally figured out how I was going to get past that and how that was working for me. And that's what I wanted to write about. And that's how Boss Mom was born. And when I went out 
out to other communities. I didn't have my own community at the time to ask them about it and say, Hey ladies, this is what I want to write about. What do you think? It was amazing. I was getting like three or 400 comments in one string when I had never, ever gotten engagement like that anywhere ever just saying, yes, please write it. Where are we going to hang out? Like, where's the support going to be? And so I knew I had something. So we went and went back to the business drawing board and said, I still want to do exactly what I'm doing now, but I want it to be for mom entrepreneurs who feel the exact same way I do and want similar things in terms of the flexibility and freedom for their life and their family. And also believe that working is important to show your children that work is not a negative word. And so that's how Boss Mom was born. We started the podcast, we started the website, we started the Facebook group, and it just grew so quickly. I mean, we've only had the brand out for a year. We're coming up on our first year anniversary and it's just grown like wildfire. And I think part of it is because I'm able to be me and and interject me and how I feel and what I'm doing into the brand of also how I help people grow their businesses and pull those kinds of people that understand who I am and where I'm at. And I can understand who they are and where they're at. And it's just this beautiful sort of symbiotic relationship that's worked really, really well. I'm not quite sure in some ways why, but it's growing like wildfire. That is so inspirational. And I want to just talk about one thing that you touched on, and that was you were kind of suppressing one of your strengths and your natural born talents. And that's definitely something that I did when I got started. And I think that so many of us do that, right? Like we're like, okay, but this over here looks really fun. Or can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah. So it's so interesting. I was asked by Pat Flynn to be part of a roundup where I got to say like, what's one of the things I would want anybody starting out to learn? Or if I looked back, I wish I would have known. And that's the one thing that I had mentioned. I've had a lot of people come to me and be like, it's interesting that you said that it's gotten me really thinking because I do believe that you should start a business based on your gifts and not on your passions. Because when you do that, then you can infuse your passions into your business, but your gifts are what come easy to you. And so what I think we often do is I think we think about our gifts in terms of tasks. I think we look at what we're good at and we go, well, I'm good at project management you know, and I'm good at, you know, making images or design or whatever that is. But what we really want to say is your gift is not the task. Your gift is the way your brain works, is the way you think, is what comes easy to you. You know, so it might be, yes, you did project management and business, but what you're good at is being detail oriented, is seeing the process one, two, three, what comes next and following that process and not being afraid to live the plan. There's a lot of things you could do in business that use those kinds of skills. So I think what we do is we think of our gifts in the task as opposed to being in the process, in the mindset. And so when I started to realize that, when I started to go, wow, my gift is seeing how things connect. My gift is is often in marketing and business growth, but that's just because my real gifts are in being able to brainstorm really quickly, being able to hear what somebody's saying and translate that into a lot of really good fruitful words and strategy on how they might leverage that in their business. That's my gift. How I've chosen to use it now is to help women actually grow their businesses, to grow their presence, to create movements, to, you know, all of those things that they want to do. But my gift isn't business strategy. It's other things. I just leverage it through business strategy. So that's I would challenge everybody listening to do is think about your gifts in terms of how your brain works as opposed to the task you perform because it opens so many opportunities for you about what you could be doing outside of corporate America or just even shifting what you're doing in your business. Yes, love that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So the next question, I think we've kind of gotten a taste, but is there anything else that you haven't talked about how being a mom has impacted your business, like on a day-to-day basis? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's funny because I really wouldn't have boss mom if I wasn't a mom. Um, (laughs) So I, I mean, I guess in some ways my kids are the only reason I have my business, right? I mean, if I wouldn't have gone through any of this and it just started a business and not have kids, then it would be a whole different world, not just from parents standpoint from a business standpoint for me. So in a lot of ways, my kids are completely my business. As far as a day to day though, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's two things that I've noticed most. Having kids on a day to day basis have impacted who I decide to work with. I've had experiences in the past where I, I worked with somebody who didn't have kids and this is not a blanket assumption about all people who don't have kids, but I worked with somebody and my son ended up getting really sick. And for a whole week, I wasn't able to do anything, but like take care of him and take him to the doctor like every day. And she didn't understand that. She was upset with me that I wasn't able to work on the project, that I wasn't able to hit a particular deadline, or I wasn't able to do something. There wasn't that compassion or empathy there. 
And it helped me really understand that in some ways, you know, my business comes first in certain things. And in some ways, my kids come first. And it kind of depends on the day and the situation as to where I'm going to set my priorities. But when my kids come first, I want to always be working with people that understand that. So now I only work with people where I've been on a call. And then I got a call from daycare that was like, you know, your daughter has 103 temperature. And the person I don't even say anything, they just hear me on the phone. And my client goes, okay, hop off, go get your daughter, I'll email you later this week. And we'll figure out like when we can and reschedule this call, just go, go do it, take care of it, you know, or I've had instances where one of my kids was homesick and they're literally laying on me sleeping while I'm having a call and same for my clients because we understand each other's world. So in a way, my kids have absolutely dictated what I do on a day-to-day basis because they've changed who I've decided to engage with and work with. And I only work with people that get that I'm a parent, get that I have kids and get that that is some flux sometimes on a day-to-day basis, even though my kids go to daycare, that's not a sure thing. And when it comes to it, I need to have clients that understand that. Yes, that is a really big lesson. And I think for any mom out there, if you're feeling like you have to choose, that's something to consider for sure. Like shifting to people that can understand where you're coming from and surrounding yourself with support. Yeah. And it's so funny because I think we go, oh gosh, but then what if, you know, I need to go where the work is. But I don't think that's true. You know, people say that we use the word niche and like get into your niche and everything like that. But it's so much more than that. Like a niche isn't just deciding who are the exact avatar. Like I always thought avatar was a funny word because it's like not a real person. It's like a fake person. And you want to be engaging with real people. So if you're going to pick an avatar, pick like an actual real person that embodies everything for you. And then make sure that person is your client. <laughs> yes. And, and work through that. But to me, it's not just a niche for my business. It's literally my life. Like I get up every morning and I live my business. It's my every day just like my kids are my every day. And I get a choice about how I want to build that. So it's not me picking my niche. I'm doing air quotes. I can't tell, you know, my niche in my business, it's picking my life. Like it's picking who I want to live with, who I want to surround myself with, who I want to care about, who I want to engage with, who I want to sit on calls with and have conversations with, who I want to help and who I want to help me. Those are real decisions. Just like I handpicked my husband you know, I want to handpick my clients because that's the life that I live every day. And just like I only want to hang out with friends that I actually enjoy, I like every single one of my clients, I would go on a vacation with and have a blast with because I only want to hang out with people that I want to hang out with. And then I pick those people that I can also connect with. And there are plenty of them out there thinking that you're making this kind of selection narrows you down. It doesn't. It actually helps people hone into you like a beacon to say, oh my gosh, I resonate with everything you're saying and everything you're doing. And I want to work with you, not anybody else, not just for your business skills, but because you are who you are. And that's when you have something beautiful and you have friendships and relationships that flourish outside of just how you're helping them for your business, which is, I think, the fun part. Yes. And after all, like, that's why we all started a business, not to create a job or surround ourselves with people we don't love. Yeah. It's funny. I think a lot of people think that way though, right? Like they think, well, I've got to make money. And it's this funny sort of oxymoron that when you start a business going, I have to make money, I have to make money. It's really hard to make money. And when you start a business going, I'm going to do what I love and I'm going to figure it out, but it's going to be only with people I love and only people I want to hang out with, only things I love to do. That's the harder way to go. But I think money comes quicker. And so it's this funny thing that when you're chasing the money, it's harder to get it. And when you're chasing the dream, so to speak, as long as you're focused with it, money comes quicker. Yes. Yes. Thank you. I love that. Okay. So now can you tell us a little bit about what success means to you? Yeah. I love this question. This is such a good question. Success to me is absolutely waking up, being excited for the day. And for me, that means a lot of other things are in place. But, you know, when I wake up in the morning, pretty much the reason I've woken up is that my son is climbing over me to get into bed. Like, you know, he's like, mom. And then he gets into bed, like climbed over me. He's like, go get my blanket. And you're like, you were in the room with your blanket. Like, why, why don't you just get it when you come into the room? Like, I don't want to get out of bed, but I love those moments. Like I wake up and this doesn't happen every day, you know, cause <laughs> things are volatile, obviously with kids and business, but success to me is absolutely waking up and enjoying what is in store for me, waking up and going, oh my God, I love that I've got kids that are ridiculous and crazy. And of course they have fits all the time, but they're amazing 
amazing. I love that I get to get on and have awesome interviews like this. And this is part of my job. And I get to talk about things I'm passionate about and create things that I care about and help build other women in their businesses and have an amazing team and do all those things. I love that I get to wake up and I get to dream about what's going to happen next year and then make it a reality. I love that we're creating freedom in my family so that I can travel more and do more things and be able to visit my family more that lives on the other side of the country. All of those things boil down to, I like waking up in the morning. And to me, success is liking to wake up in the morning. In the mornings where I wake up and I don't feel good about something, I really try to quickly pinpoint what it is and then change it or fix it or alter it or work through it really quickly so that I do enjoy waking up every morning. And that's sort of my test is if I'm waking up going, oh, I do not want to do that thing today. That's when I go, okay, does somebody else on my team, can they do it better? Do I need to just, you know, call somebody to hold me accountable to it? You know, all those things, but it's sort of my trigger. And I think that's what helps me always feel like I'm being successful. I don't know. That was a pretty long answer, wasn't it? (laughs) That is such a good answer because I think so many people base it on money or base it on other things, but ultimately that's what we really want is joy, right? Is like being happy is what we're really aiming for. And I think that the way that you described it as like waking up excited is so good communication, obviously, because that's your strength. But (laughs) it's just a really good way to communicate it. Right. Yeah. I love Al Elrod who does the Miracle Morning. Mm -hmm. He used to live here in San Diego and we're mutual friends. And I love it because every time you talk to him, he talks about this idea of getting up in the morning. But what he cares about is that when you wake up in the morning, you don't wake up early just to get more done. You wake up early in the morning because you're excited to get an extra hour of your life. And that's how he describes it. And I love how he talks about that because that's how he lives. And that's how the Miracle Morning community lives because that's how you should feel. Like your life isn't just this thing where we have to figure stuff out. Like your life has all of these opportunities and we have a choice. Just like we have a choice when we start our own business to grow our own business in the same way or to have kids or not have kids or to travel. Like all those decisions you make boil down to all of the adventures you get to have. And I think Albert Einstein said something to the effect of life can either be a daring adventure or it can be nothing. And I really do believe that. Like even the tiny little things we do every day, those are choices we make about how we want our life to be and how we want to engage in life. And I honestly think success is a lot of waking up and deciding to show up in your own life. Yeah, that's so powerful. So is there anything along your journey that you wish you knew sooner? I know we talked about one of them, but is there anything else? Yeah. Well, I mean, the biggest one that I'll always talk about is community. Like I literally just posted an Instagram today that no boss mom is an island because that's so true. I remember, you know, I think a lot of entrepreneurs, we can do a lot of things. We're like, oh, well, I can go into Canva and I can make images and I can, you know, go and learn WordPress and I'll go learn this tool and this tool and all these things. Isn't that great that I know how to do all of these things? That's really not a way to run a business. And I became so much more successful. I think not just financially, but brand wise and how things kind of flow. And now I'm not going out, you know, my marketing strategy is much less of going out and trying to find business and much more of figuring out how to refine my intake process because we're getting business that's just kind of finding us. And so, you know, as you're going through that whole process, I've learned I give things away to people that are going to do it better than me. And I look at my numbers and I go, well, I'll just need to make more if I need to pay this person because this person is going to help me make much more because I'm handing it off. So as I started to hand little things off and now it's sort of an addiction, if I'm looking at something and I was like, "Mm, could I have somebody else that could do this better than me and like this more than me? And I could make more money freeing up that hour to do what I'm really great at by giving it to this person. Then it's a no brainer for me. That's for me where I started to recognize that I don't, want to be an island. I don't see the value in being able to do all these things. I see the value in giving them to people who enjoy doing them, that that's their gift and finding the right people that are going to nurture and love my business and what I'm doing and build the team that way. So the biggest thing for me was I just thought I was a really great entrepreneur by doing everything myself. And it took me a long time to realize that great entrepreneurs have great teams and great support systems and great communities. That is such a powerful lesson. And I think we've all been there, like starting off and you're like, but how am I going to pay for this? And really, it does take that little leap of faith and knowing that it's going to free up your time, which is honestly way more valuable than 
what we give credit to ourselves for at the beginning, for sure. Yeah. And if you're thinking about that, about, oh, it's the cost and all those things, the one bit of advice I will tell you that is the most important thing if you're going out and looking to have somebody on your team is that your team should be all of your ideal clients. Like don't bring a social media person on that doesn't get exactly what you care about, exactly what you stand for, exactly what you are. I mean, the person I have now can write content for me and it's exactly the way I would say it. And sometimes better. She comes up with things that I'm like, oh my God, that's brilliant. Or she says, how about we couple these things two together or do this here or highlight this? And I'm like, oh my God, that's exactly how I would want to do it. How are you in my brain? Because she's exactly what a boss mom is, exactly what I envision the women who work with me best, who love the brand, who embody it. Every single person on my team is my ideal client. And that to me is part of why my team works so well is because they not only understand the brand and can speak to the brand, but they love the brand. They love everything we come out with. They get super excited about it. So they love to work on it. They love to share it. They love to connect with it and connect other people with it. And that just works to your advantage. And it's an uphill battle if you're hiring somebody again for the skill, as opposed to hiring them as your ideal client who also has the skill. They've got to have both or else you're just not going to get all of the value you could be getting out of the team. Yes. Oh, that's a really good one. I never thought of it like that. That's a really good one. (laughs) Is there anything that you do every day to like stay on top of your game? Yeah. Well, I use Trello. Like it's everything in my life. I'm literally in it like 20 times a day. And so every single day I do a quick assessment. Okay. What needs to happen? What needs to get done? I think I could honestly say I'm extremely well organized, but I have good systems And so for me, every single day I have, you know, you can't see it, but I've got like a file of pretty pink on brand filing system. And I have a slot for every day of the week. And the only folders that are allowed out are the ones that are in those slots that tell me what I need to focus on. So that if I've got a client that day, it always goes back into, you know, the Wednesday or whatever it is. And so I have that, I have my, you know, in Trello that kind of helps me keep on track of what has to get done. And then my Google calendar is I look and say, great, where's my, where's space? What am I doing? Who do I've got today? Do I need to prepare for? So every single day I'm doing a quick check-in and assessment of what needs to happen. Is it realistic? Has anything else come up? Those kinds of things so that I can stay on task. And then this is key. When I have days where I find myself staring at my computer for 10 minutes and being like, what was I supposed to do? Like, I'm just not motivated to do anything. I immediately go to my calendar and say, okay, can I leave the office and like go somewhere and get some fresh air and think about something differently or get myself in a different space? Should I take some time and just push things off so that I don't forget things or I don't go, Oh no, crap, Dana, you need to be doing this thing that was due, you know, today to this client or this thing that I'm going, okay, no, you need to go to a different location and snap into it. Or you need to go and just give yourself some time. So I don't ignore it when I recognize (laughs) that I am not on task at all. I say, how can I make sure I'm giving myself that space or going to a different location to create a better space for myself to get back into it? And that helps me a lot. Yeah. So it sounds like it's really like self-assessment, like checking in to not just what is on my list for today, but like, what do I need to do to get in the space I need to get to do the things I need to do? Yeah, it's funny. My parents like forever and a day ago did this thing in Chicago. It was like a test run and it was called thin tuition. And it was this idea of not dieting, but listening to your body. Like when you sigh after you eat and you go, "Ah," like put your fork down, your body is telling you that it's full and it's trying to like physically make more room for you to eat more. (laughs) (laughs) Um, listen to that. And so I always love that because it made me go, well, I need to listen to everything in my body, like in my mind and in the way I work. Like I need to listen to maybe something is going on or maybe I'm tired or maybe I'm just in a space where I'm not focused. You know, listen to what you're doing. Listen to how you're thinking. Listen to how focused you are. Understand the different times of days that really work well for you. Like I used to think I'm a night person, but to be honest, when I really look at my nighttime, I kind of dilly dally and I'm not massively focused. So I might seem like I'm getting a lot done, but if I didn't give myself that time, 
and I do it in, you know, in the morning, then all of a sudden I'm not staying up late, but I have more energy to get up earlier. And when my day starts, I can be super focused then. And so it's all about reading your own signs and being open and mindful of them and then adjusting how you run your business and your life to those things. And I think it's life changing because your body and the way you think and work will tell you everything you need. Like you're not doing something on your checklist, then maybe it's because you have a mind block on doing that thing. Break it down even farther until you get excited about acting on it and all of a sudden things get checked off your list. But you have to recognize first that you're not checking it off your list and being mindful of that and act on it in order to tweak and change until things work for you. Okay, awesome. Yeah. So could you talk about, if you're open to this, can you talk about a challenge or a failure that you experienced in your life or business and how you overcame it? Yeah, sure. Oh gosh, tons of failures, I think. But one, I mean, I feel like I come up with those all the times of like, oh crap, why did you do that, Dana? (laughs) That was not a smart decision. Um, But I think one of the ones that I think might be most impactful and powerful for people listening is when I was in corporate America, I was in a situation with a really amazing company, but they ended up having a kind of switch in management. And I had been hired specifically by the person that was leaving. And so I could see it kind of ripple affecting. I was at the director level at the time that all the people in the director levels were getting laid off basically. And so I had a choice, right? I had a choice to ignore it. And to me, that wasn't necessarily a failure, But, you know, I mean, it seemed that way. Like if you're going to get laid off, that seems pretty much failure-ish, right? And so I had this choice where I could either ignore it or just not say anything about it. And what I chose to do is I chose to go to the person that they had just hired and actually invite him out to lunch. And we sat down and I said, I'm not an idiot. I see what's happening. How much time do I have? And what can I do to ensure that my team is in the best position? And we actually worked out a 90 day plan for me to resign. And in that 90 days, it gave me a ton of time to assess. And I eventually assessed that I wanted to just go and start my own business. But it gave myself time to, you know, make sure my team was set up to, you know, work to bring somebody else in and train them, all of those things. And so at that point, I had that choice to either see it as this failure, see it as this thing where I was going to lose my job, or I had a choice to take the reins and do something with it. And I think, you know, I have a friend, Nicole Keating, who runs the Art of Epic Wellness podcast, and she always says that you turn poison into medicine. And so for everybody out there who's going, oh my gosh, I just got laid off or, oh my gosh, I did this thing and it totally failed and it didn't work. You know, I love the idea of saying, how can you learn from that? How can you figure out, you know, how to turn it around and leverage it for you? And when I talk about losing my job, basically to people, they're like, wow, that sounds not negative at all. You are like, well, yeah, it's because how you decide to see it. It's so funny because people are like, no, 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 I want you to tell me about a failure. And I'm like, I am. I just don't ever see my failures as negative. You know, I mean, if they're going to happen, they're, they're going to happen. And I need to learn from them as quickly as possible. I think the most successful entrepreneurs aren't the ones that don't fail. They're the ones that are super agile and super flexible that bounce back and go, all right, it failed. I've got five minutes to think about it. Let's figure it out. Okay, now I've got to move on and go to the next thing. And so that's, yeah, for anybody that's lost their job or leaving their job or looking to maybe pivot their business they currently have, just look at it, how you can leverage it as opposed to feeling as though it's a failure. Wow, that's a huge lesson. And I've totally noticed that as well with the entrepreneurs that we've had on so far And I'm sure many more to come. And that's really why I wanted to ask that question, because I think it's such a common misconception that people think, oh, it just must be so easy over there. (laughs) No, no, it's not. And I'll tell you, starting a business is hard. Growing a business is hard. (laughs) You know, it's all hard. It's just like a kid, like a kid has all of these emotions that they go through every day. It's like I never experienced so many emotions in a 24 hour period on a consistent basis than you do when you have kids. And it's the same thing with your business, you know, things are going amazing. And then all of a sudden something stops, your website stops coming up, you know, everything's going amazing. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, someone's violating my trademark. And I really did not want to go and like have to tell them because I feel like a jerk every time I have to tell somebody to stop using my trademark, you know, oh, I, this was amazing. Oh, great. We want to grow and start a live event. That's a whole new <laughs> side of your business. You've got to figure out. It's like when your kids are like, I've got this amazing routine. Oh no. Now they're teething. And now I have no idea 
idea what I'm doing. Or now I've got a potty train. Like no matter what, everything you do in your business is going to feel great and then be totally challenging and then feel amazing and then make you want to weep. Like it's a total roller coaster ride, but it's massively rewarding just like kids are. As long as you stay focused to your goal, that just like kids, your goal is not to raise great kids. Your goal is to raise great adults. It's the same thing with your business. Like your goal is not to just start a business and run a business. Your goal is to raise and nurture a business so that it can contribute to the community and contribute to the world through your gifts and what you're building. Like that should be your ultimate goal. And if you can stay focused on that, then success is imminent, I believe. I love that. Oh my gosh. (laughs) Okay. So let's switch gears a little bit. This is a fun question because this is basically how I started. And so if you had to start all over again, you had no business, no team, no list, no connections, and you only had three hours a day and $5,000, what would you do? (laughs) Yes. Well, I think one of the first things is I would go out and start to make those connections. I mean, the biggest thing that I did is to go out and have other people help me make decisions, which doesn't cost you any money. And to be honest, it doesn't cost you a massive amount of time because while you'd be sitting there trying to figure out what you're going to name your business, what your business tagline is going to be, what you're going services you're going to offer, you go out, throw those things out into other people's communities where they've already built those, but that speaks to you and your ideal client. And you say, Hey, what do you guys think? Like, which one would you choose? Which one did you prefer? Like, I need your help making a decision. So I think one thing is it doesn't cost a lot of time or money. And I go out and ask people to help me make decisions. The second thing I would do is I always think everybody should dedicate three hours a day you have for the first couple of weeks to figuring out what on earth you're actually doing. You know, build a business plan for yourself. You know, who are you talking to? So you actually go to the right groups. Like, who do you want to be? I call them your deal breakers and your dream makers. Like, what are those things? What is the purpose of your business and what do you want to grow? And I would dedicate all of my time in the first week to figuring that out. That doesn't take any money either because where I would dedicate my money would absolutely be in somebody for branding, somebody who helps me create consistency in my imagery, someone who helps me uncover what my coloring and my feel is, who helps me create all of those things so that everything I put out into the world consistently feels like me and consistently feels like what I'm trying to do. Like for me, that is the number one killer of businesses is people who don't do that. And there's inconsistency and it's hard to pull people in because they don't know really what you are and what you stand for. So a lot of my money would go towards branding and creating a really cohesive, great brand. And then the other part of the money would go towards somebody to help me in social media or PR or something like that, depending on what you want to do to actually go out and consistently be out in the world where you don't have time in three hours a day to actually do. And those two things, branding and like social media presence um, would be the two places where I'd go out and get support because they're the things I don't really want to do. And I know they're not my gift, but they are two of the most important things where we're not consistent enough on our own and we need that kind of support. Those are great takeaways, everybody listening. So thank (laughs) you for that. Is there anything else that I haven't asked you that you'd want to share with moms who are starting out their businesses and want to take their business to the next level? Yeah, I think don't pretend. I know that seems kind of vague, but I see so many women out there that are under this veil of a successful business. But when you really get to know them, they're like, I'm not making money. My margins are terrible. I'm spending all this time. Like, I'm not sure what I'm doing this for anymore. But on the outside, they look amazing and it looks pristine. And the way I think what people think is I have to be amazing and pristine in order for people to want to buy my services and buy my things. But I think what you do is you don't open yourself up to get the support you need, or you don't open yourself up to connect with people because there's nothing worse than having everybody think you have a six figure business and then realize that that's not the case. When, if you would have been just honest about, Hey guys, I'm doing this, but you know, I'm thinking about going into other ventures and expanding in this way because these margins aren't amazing. You know, making mugs is not a great margin or making this particular thing or doing this particular thing is not getting me where I want to go. I'm thinking of maybe pivoting. What do you guys think? And be really honest about where you are and then where you want to go because not being honest means nobody knows to be able to help you but being honest about it opens you up to go oh well yeah why don't we just switch it up because if you added this on or you switch this here 
you may find a lot more success and there's much better ways to bring in income if you do this and this versus this over here. And obviously it's always specific to who you're talking to, but I think that's the biggest thing. We hide behind the veil of perfection. And the moment I stopped doing that and started going, Hey guys, I need to make more money because what I'm doing in my business right now is not doing the trick. Let's talk about that. And I started being honest about that on the podcast and out in places I'm at that, that honesty allows you to help build your business in a way that is successful and whatever that means to you. So I think that would be my biggest piece of advice. Just be open and honest with yourself and the world, and it will actually do more good than you generally think it would. Yeah, I love that. And I think it also humanizes you, right? All of this imperfection, like that's part of life. That's part of what we're doing here. And it normalizes you as a person. So not only will you get the help you need, But I think also it's going to allow you to be human and have people see you as that. Yeah. I think when you admit that out into the open, it's like, you know, going to a, like one of the kind of recovering meetings, you know, like an addict meeting. Because I just watched Bones, an episode where he's a gambling addict. And the guy said, showing up to these meetings isn't going to get you where you want to go. You got to stand up and you have to declare to the world what's wrong so you can fix it. So I think sometimes when we are vulnerable, like I find that my boss, my podcast for me is very therapeutic because I'll start talking and then I'll start telling somebody about something about a process or something that's happened to me or something that I want to be vulnerable about. And then I get off of recording it and I'm like, Oh, okay. I need to listen to my own advice and do this thing, you know, or, Oh my gosh, that made me feel like a total weight lifted off of me. Now I can get back to work. And so I think when we are honest out into the world, it doesn't just attract people. It's actually helpful internally to us to start recognizing those things. So we can go, Oh, wait, yeah, you're right. Like I'm doing all of this work and not making money. Like I need to switch some things up. Who can I get to support me out in the community or somebody or rethink it myself to make it work a different way? Because, you know, there's nothing worse than I think, what is it? Insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Yes. And the only way you can recognize you're doing something over and over again and not getting any better results is by recognizing that something's wrong. And so I think when you open yourself to be vulnerable out to the community, it sort of is that accountability that makes your brain go, oh, maybe I should pay attention to this. And I think that's where real positive change happens. Yeah. And I want to say too, like, I think sometimes we're just way too close to our business to see that ourselves. Like I had a thing where I used to call my community, the super moms and it was cool. I had a, you know, my vision of what I thought super mom was and not everybody else agreed with me. They thought it was the mom that needed to delegate. Well, apparently (laughs) that was not what I thought. I thought it was a high achieving mom. So it wasn't until I got really honest with the community. I was like, what does this mean to you? Right. And like, this is not working. Like there are things about this messaging that's just off. Right. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's when I had some introspection and then my coach and a few other of my friends were like, well, duh, you are a high achiever. And I just did not want to see that. Right. So whatever it is, you might just be so close to it that you can't put words to it, but other people can help you and see it for you. Yeah, absolutely. Totally agree. Awesome. So I know you are working on some community stuff and even a retreat. So can you tell us how people can find out more about you and some of the projects that you're working on? Yeah. The easiest place to go is boss-mom.com. And we have the Facebook community, boss-mom.com forward slash Facebook. So yeah, just go to our website and hang out with us. All that fun stuff. Awesome. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to get this episode out there for everybody. And thanks for coming on. Yeah. Thanks for having me. You've been listening to the Mom Entrepreneur Success Podcast. Thanks so much for tuning in. Now, I'd love to hear from you. Head on over to iTunes and leave us a rating and review. By reviewing the show, it allows us to reach more moms to help them grow their businesses. So head on over there, leave us an honest rating, and I can't wait to catch up with you there. By the way, every single week, I'm going to select one winner who leaves a review and you'll be able to get a free strategy session with me in this 20 minute laser focused session. You'll get the information that you need to move your business to the next level of success that you desire. Have an awesome day.